Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on reversible reactor. Now, before you watch this, make sure you are secure in your understanding of rates of reaction and endo and exothermic reactions. And I've got videos on both of those things earlier in the playlist, should you need. Now, in this video, we'll start off by looking at what we mean by a reversible reaction. Then we'll look at the idea of dynamic equilibrium. Then we'll spend some time looking at a sort of simulation of dynamic equilibrium so that we can understand where it comes from. Then we'll explore the harbour process. Um, we'll look at how systems at equilibrium respond to changes. And then we will try and explain the harbour process as well. OK, so what are reversible reactions? A reversible reaction is a reaction that can go backwards as well as forwards. So what that means is that in the same way that the reactants can be converted into products, some of the products can be converted back into reactants. The reaction can be reversed. Now, an example of that might be this one. We'll look at this a lot more later in this uh, uh, video. But nitrogen reacting with hydrogen to make ammonia is a reversible reaction. Now, if you're paying attention, you might have noticed that we've got this funny looking arrow there. That arrow, we call it the equilibrium arrow or the reversible reaction arrow means that a reaction is reversible. And let's just look at the way that it's um, written. It is not a forwards arrow and a backwards arrow like that, but it is two half arrows. So each half bit has just a single part to its head rather than two parts to its head. Now, if we look at a normal reaction and we measure the concentration of reactants over time, what we'd see is that the concentration of reactants starts out high and it decreases over time to zero. And we see that here. So we see that on our normal reaction, the concentration of reactants starts up really high and finishes right down at zero. And equally, if we look at the products, the concentration of products starts out at zero and it ends up somewhere close to the original concentration of the reactants. And again, we can see that here. So on our graph, the products concentration is starting out low and finishing high. And the reason for this is because all of the reactants get converted into products. Now, if we compare that to a reversible reaction, we get quite a different graph, which looks like this. So they look similar. The concentration of reactants does start out high and it does decrease, but it doesn't decrease all the way to zero. It stays at some value significantly above zero. And equally, the original concentration of products does start out at zero and it does increase, but it doesn't increase to the original concentration of the reactants. It finishes up at some value significantly below where the reactants started. And that's a sign that a reaction is reversible because when it's finished, we've got significant amounts of both our reactants and our products rather than only having our products. Okay, so now we're gonna meet a really important concept, which is the idea of dynamic equilibrium. Now, to understand this, we need to think a little bit about the rates of chemical reactions and how we can show them on a graph. Now, if we produce a graph of time on the x-axis and the concentration of reactants and products on the y-axis, the gradient of that graph tells us the rate of the reaction. So you can see, you can see on these sections here where it's steeper, the rate is faster. And on these sections here where it's shallower, the rate is slower. Now, we can combine all the information from that graph into a second kind of graph where instead of concentration on the y-axis we put the rate on the y-axis so now it's not the steepness of the line that tells us the rate it's the height of the line on the y-axis that tells us the rate and on these graphs the forward reaction starts out fast but it slows down over time we can see that it starts out high and that line gradually gets lower and lower as the rate of the forge reaction slows down. And that's because the concentration of the reactants that it needs decreases. Equally, the backwards reaction, the blue line, starts out really slowly. Okay, So the backwards reaction starts slow, but over time it speeds up. And that happens because the concentration of the products that it needs gradually increases over time. And we can see that here. So the rate of the backwards reaction is starting out slow, but getting faster and faster and faster. And what you can see then is eventually those two rates meet. We end up with the rate of the forwards reaction and the backwards reaction being the same. And that leads to a situation that we call 
dynamic equilibrium. Equilibrium means something like balance. And dynamic means something like moving. So this is a situation where we reach this balance point in the reaction, where it no longer changes. And at this point, the rate of the forwards and backwards reactions are equal. So the reaction hasn't stopped. The forwards and backwards reactions are still happening, but their effects are cancelling each other out. And we can see that on the graph here. We can see the way that the rates of the forwards and backwards reactions are equal. We can also see on the first graph this situation here where the concentration of the products and the concentration of the reactants stops changing. It stays constant, not equal to each other, but constant. Now, the reason why is because when the rate of the forwards and backwards reaction is equal, every reactant that is used in the forwards reaction is replaced by a product in the backwards reaction regenerating that lost reactant. So now we're going to look at why reversible reactions happen. The content we're going to look at over the next few slides does go beyond what's required of the GCSE. You would not be examined on any of the ideas in these next few slides, but it can help to improve your understanding. So I think it's worthwhile to include in the video. So reversible reactions happen when the reactants and the products in a reaction have similar amounts of chemical energy. That means there's a small energy change for the reaction. This means that the activation energy for the forwards reaction is similar to the activation energy for the backwards reaction. And we can see that here. So here's our reaction profile for our reversible reaction. We've got the reactants and the products with similar amounts of energy. There's not a big difference in their energy. And that means that the activation energy for the forwards reaction is similar to the activation energy for the backwards reaction. This means that once any products form, there's a good chance that some of them will have the activation energy required to react and turn back into the reactants that we started with. And we can see that if we do a sort of simulation, a, a sort of pretend reversible reaction um, in which blue squares will react and turn into gold squares. Now, what we're going to say in our little simulation is that every turn, half of the blue squares will turn gold and a quarter of the gold squares will turn blue. And just to keep the math simple, if we've got any decimals, we're going to round them down. OK, now half of the blue squares turning gold is a bit like our forwards reaction having a low activation energy and a, only a quarter of the gold turning back to blue is like our backwards reaction having a high activation energy. So let's see how this works out. We're going to start out with 48 gold, uh, sorry, 48 blue squares and zero gold squares. Now we said that a half of the blues will turn gold each time, so that means 24 of those blues are going to turn gold, and a quarter of the golds will turn back to blue. Now a quarter of zero is just zero, so that leads us to this situation, where we've now got 24 blues and 24 golds. Now again, half of the blues are going to turn gold. So that is half of half of 24 will give us 12 and a quarter of the 24 golds will turn back to blue. So that is six. And so we get another change. And we can see here these ones outlined in red. Those are the six um, blues that were previously gold. And these 12 here are the 12 golds that were previously blue. Let's do another round of change. Half of our 18 blues will turn gold, so that will be nine changes. And a quarter of our 30 golds will turn blue. Now we're going to round that down. Um, so a quarter of 30, roughly speaking, is seven. And that leads to this situation where we've now got 16 blues and 32 golds. And if we look, the ones in red, these are the, gold, the blues that were gold a second ago. And these ones in red over here are the golds that were blue a second ago. So now what happens? We get another round of change. So half of our 16 blues will turn gold. So that will be eight of them. And a quarter 
of our 32 golds will turn blue, that will be eight of them. So eight blues turn gold, eight golds turn blue. Overall, there's no change. These ones outlined in red, these are the eight blues that were gold. And these ones outlined in red were the eight golds that were just blue. But overall, there's no change. Let's try and do another round of change. And again, we end up with half of our 16 blues turning gold, which is eight. And a quarter of our 32 golds turning blue, which is eight again. And so that leads us to this situation again, where we've still got 16 blues and 32 golds, with these eight blues being the ones that have just turned from being gold, and these eight golds being the ones that have just turned from being blue. And so this is our state of dynamic equilibrium, which has naturally risen out of the rules of this little game, where because the rates of the forwards and backwards reaction are now equal, the concentrations of the amounts of blues and golds stay constant. So if we spend a little bit of time analysing what we've just been doing with our gold and blue squares, a graph looks something like this. So we can see how the number of our blue reactant starts out high and then it decreases rapidly to some value that is not zero. And then our concentration of golds, our products, starts out at zero and then increases to some value that is below the original starting point of the blues, that graph looks essentially identical to the graph we would expect for a dynamic equilibrium situation. So what you can see is that from the simple rules of this game, the phenomenon of dynamic equilibrium has naturally arisen. And this is the same kind of maths as that which actually leads to dynamic equilibrium in chemical reactions in real life. Um, and this flat area on the graph, that is our dynamic equilibrium naturally arising. OK, so now we're going to look at how we form ammonia uh, via a process called the Harbour process. And this is a really important application of these ideas of reversible reactions and dynamic equilibrium. So ammonia, NH3, is a super important gas. It's used for making fertilisers. Um, in fact, there are billions more people currently alive in the world than would otherwise be the case because we can grow so much more food than we used to because of fertilisers that are based on ammonia. We can also use it to make explosives as well. So there's a sort of irony to ammonia because we can use it to both grow the food to make people and make the explosives to kill people. Now, ammonia is made by the following reversible reaction. We saw it in the example at the start of the video. Nitrogen plus hydrogen reacts to make ammonia. So that is one N2 gas reacting with three H2 gas to produce two NH3 gas. Now this is a reversible reaction, which is a real problem if we're in control of a uh, ammonia factory, because a lot of the, the um, ammonia that we make will straight away start converting itself back into nitrogen and hydrogen. And that's not what we want. So the whole idea of the harbour process, why the harbour process is such a big deal, is because it's got a set of conditions that maximises the amount of ammonia that we can make and minimises the kind of downsides of that equilibrium. So our conditions in the harbour process are like this. First of all, we have a very high temperature of about 450 degrees Celsius. You don't need the exact number, just memorise that it's a high temperature. And what this does is that increases the reaction rate. We use a high pressure, about 150 times greater than atmospheric pressure. And what that does is that increases the percentage yield. So it means that more of our reactants get converted into products and less of the products convert back to reactants. And the last thing we have is we use an iron catalyst, which speeds up the rate of the reaction as well. OK, and our apparatus for that looks like this. So this is a giant piece of industrial machinery. And we have this very high pressure chamber there where we pump our nitrogen and our hydrogen into it. We pass it through this iron catalyst there and we produce a mixture of some ammonia and some nitrogen and some hydrogen because the reaction mixture has reached equilibrium. And then what happens is it goes into this coolant chamber and that quickly cools the ammonia down to become a liquid so it can come out the bottom, whilst the unused nitrogen and hydrogen get recirculated back round to have another go at reacting and turning into ammonia. Okay, so now we're going to look at some higher tier material. 
which is to try and understand how systems at equilibrium respond to changes. And the first change we'll look at is increasing or decreasing the temperature. Now, for reasons that are very complicated and we won't go into now, when a reaction is in this state of dynamic equilibrium, it will respond to changes in such a way as to reverse or to minimise that change. So let's look at a couple of examples. Our first one is what we just saw. This is nitrogen and hydrogen reacting to make ammonia. And this is an exothermic reaction. What that means is essentially that the products side of the reaction is the hotter side because heat is being released. And the reactant side of it is the colder side um, of the reaction because um, we absorb heat to produce our reactants. So what this means, if we were to increase the temperature, the reaction would shift back towards the left, okay? Because that would go towards the colder side and that would reverse our increase in temperature. So what we could say is the equilibrium, what we say is it shifts left and that means that the yield of products decreases. So that means, let's say our percentage yield was 20%. If we heat it up, now our percentage yield might only be 10% because the equilibrium position has shifted towards the left. Equally, if we decrease the temperature, the equilibrium will try and do the reverse of that, which is to bring the temperature back up again. So it will shift towards the hotter side of the equilibrium. So what we can say is the equilibrium will shift right. What that will mean is that the yield of products will increase. Now, because it's colder, the reaction will be slower but ultimately, once the reaction is completed, the yield of products will be higher. What about a reaction that's endothermic? So this is the way that um, sulfur trioxide, SO3, can break down to form sulfur dioxide and oxygen. Now, this is an endothermic process. So that means that the product side this time is the cold side of the reaction and the reactant side is the hot side of the reaction. So if we increase the temperature, the equilibrium will respond by trying to reverse that increase and shifting towards the colder side. So in this case, the equilibrium will shift right and the yield of products will increase. Not only will it increase, but because the uh, temperature has increased it will get there faster as well so this is a kind of a win-win we get more product and we get it faster and equally if we decrease the temperature the equilibrium will try to respond by reversing that increase and it will shift over towards the hotter side of the uh, reaction so that means the equilibrium in this case would shift left and that will um, so the yield of products that's the mass of products that we form, the yield of products would decrease. Okay. Now, what about if we change the pressure rather than the temperature? Now, importantly here, the pressure of a gas is proportional to the number of gas molecules. And we're going to see the same thing as on the previous slide. The equilibrium will respond in such a way as to minimise any change. So let's look at this um, uh, ammonia reaction again. So N2G reacting with H three H2Gs to make two NH3G. So we've got two gas molecules on the right and three, four gas molecules on the left. So that makes the left side the higher pressure side because there are more gas molecules and the right side the lower pressure side because there are fewer gas molecules. So what this means, if we increase the pressure, the equilibrium will try and shift towards the lower pressure side to reverse that increase in pressure. So we can say the equilibrium will shift right 
and so the yield of products will increase. Equally, if we did the opposite and tried to decrease the pressure, the equilibrium would respond by shifting to the left side of the reaction, which is the higher pressure side, because that would reverse that pressure decrease. And so we can say the equilibrium has shifted uh, left, and we could say that the yield of products decreases. And let's look at one more example, which is this reaction here, the same one we saw last time. So we've got the sulfur trioxide decomposing to make sulfur dioxide and oxygen. And this time we've got more gas molecules on the left, three. So that makes the left the high pressure side. And there are only two gas molecules. So uh, the right is the high pressure side. And on the left, there's only two gas molecules. So that makes that the low uh, pressure side. So this time, if we increase the pressure, the equilibrium will respond by shifting towards the lower pressure side to try and reverse that increase. So therefore, we can say that the equilibrium shifts left and that the yield of products will um, uh, decrease. And equally, if we try and decrease the pressure, the equilibrium will try and reverse that change by shifting towards the high pressure side. So in this one, decreasing the pressure will cause the equilibrium to shift uh, towards the right and the yield of products increases. So to understand the effect of change in pressure, we need to count the number of gas molecules on each side because the side with the most gas molecules will be the higher pressure side. Okay, so the last change we're going to look at is changes in concentration. Um, and we can use changes in concentration to manipulate the position of the equilibrium in much the same way as we could with the temperature and the pressure. So the idea will be that the equilibrium will respond in such a way as to reverse or to minimize our changes. So the example we're going to work with is this one, where we'll look at bromine, Br2, reacting with water, H2O, to make hypobromous acid, HOBr, and hydrobromic acid, HBr. You don't need to know what any of those chemicals are, we're just going to apply the idea to explain how the equilibrium is affected by changes in concentration. So let's imagine we increase the concentration of a reactant, um, Br2. So we've got Br2 over here. We want to try and reverse that increase. So the equilibrium will shift towards the right. And that means we'll make more of our products. So the yield will increase. OK. What about if we increased the concentration of a product, say HOBr? Well, in this case, to minimize our increase in product, the equilibrium is going to want to shift that way to remove some of that product. So the equilibrium will shift left. And that means our yield will decrease. And what about decreasing things? So if we decrease a reactant, for example, H2O, what will happen this time? is we'll try and reverse that decrease by regenerating some more H2O. So again, the reaction will, the equilibrium will shift left and that will decrease our yield. But that should then mean that if we've lost some of our yield, we've restored some of that lost H2O. So we've reversed our change. And lastly, what about if we decrease our product concentration, our HBr in this case? Well, if we remove the HBr, we want to try and reverse that change by regenerating more of the HBr. So the equilibrium in this case would shift right. And that means our yield will increase. Now, chemists and you know chemical engineers, the people that run chemical factories, they know this stuff. So they really consciously take advantage of their understanding of equilibrium to manipulate all the conditions, the temperature, the pressure and the concentration 
to maximize the amount of yield they produce and to minimize the time it takes. Okay, so now we're going to apply the ideas from the previous couple of slides to try and explain the conditions that we use in the harbor process. Now to remind ourselves, the harbor process is this. Nitrogen reacts with hydrogen to produce ammonia. That is one nitrogen gas plus three H2 gases, making two NH3 gases. And importantly, this is an exothermic process. So we use a high temperature of 450 degrees Celsius. Now that might seem a bit strange. And the reason it seems strange is because this is an exothermic reaction. So that means the products is the hot side and the reactants is the cold side, which means that if we increase the temperature, the equilibrium will adjust to try and reverse that increase and it will actually shift towards the left and reduce our percentage yield. However, because it's hotter, the rate of reaction is much increased. So although we produce a smaller yield, we reach equilibrium much, much more quickly. And therefore, we can make our product more quickly, even though the actual yield of it is lower. I did the maths once, and if you lower the temperature to sort of minus 20 or 30 Celsius, you could get a much higher percentage yield, but it would take over a million years to get there. So it's clearly better to produce a small yield very quickly rather than a high yield extraordinarily slowly. The next condition to think about is the pressure, which is a high pressure of around 150 atmospheres. Now to understand this, we have to remind ourselves that the pressure of a system is related to the number of gas molecules. And that means that because the reactant side has got four gas molecules, that makes the reactants the high pressure side of the reaction whilst the products that have only got two gas molecules is the low pressure side. So by increasing the pressure, the equilibrium will try and reverse that increase by shifting towards the right, which means we will increase the percentage yield of the products, um, which is exactly what we want. We want to get more of our ammonia. Our last condition is that we have an iron catalyst. Now the iron catalyst um, like all catalysts, that will increase the rate of reaction. It does not affect the percentage yield, but it just means that we get our yield much faster than if we didn't use it. Okay, so that's it. The end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.